talk about a period in American history known as the Road to Revolution. Now, these are all of the events that lead to the Revolutionary War. You can start as early as you want to. You could go all the way back to Jamestown to connect these chain of events. But we're going to start at the French and Indian War. The French and Indian War begins with arguments over land, specifically the Ohio River Valley. The Ohio River Valley is the region of land between the Ohio River and the Great Lakes. Now, this region of land is very, very rich in natural resources. It's good for farming, and it also has very good access to the Ohio River, which is useful for trade. The British colonies to the east are interested in expanding westwards into the Ohio River Valley, but at the same time, the French colonies from the west are interested in expanding east into the Ohio River Valley. So what we have here is a, this land is your land, oh no, it's my land, oh wait, we actually have no idea whose land it is because we never established real borders between our colonies. The French get there first, then the British colonists, specifically Virginia, charge in, they try and get rid of the French, they fire some shots, and it starts the French and Indian War. Now if it's fought between the British and the French, I know what you're thinking here, why is it called the French and Indian War? All right, now that's actually pretty easy to explain in reality. It's because the British are fighting against the French and their Native American allies. Now, why would the Native Americans side with the French rather than the British? Well, let's take a look at the way they run their colonies. When the French show up in the New World or in North America, they're there primarily to expand their fish trade and their fur trade. And so they're actually working with the Native Americans. The Native Americans are their trading partners. And so the French population is pretty spread out. They don't have large farms. Instead, they're mostly frontiersmen spending time in the woods, trapping these animals and skinning them for their fur. So they have a good working relationship with the Native Americans. However, when the British arrive in the New World, they're also there to make their mother country richer, but they're going to do it in a different way. They're going to do it by farming. And in order to farm, you have to have large tracts of land. And so what the British colonists do is they push the Native Americans off of their lands, and instead they take them for themselves. And they start growing things like tobacco, things like rice, later on even things like cotton. And so all of this takes a whole lot of land, and it's continually pushing the Native Americans further and further back, which leads to, one, arguments over land, but two, tension and conflict between those two groups. So it's no surprise that when a war between the French colonists and the British colonists begin, it shouldn't be that shocking that the Native Americans choose to side with the French. All right, so the French and Indian War begins, and it's primarily fought over the Ohio River Valley. So over the Ohio River Valley. The thing is, though, the French and Indian War is fought between the British colonies in the New World and the French colonies in the New World. But it's not just a war between groups of colonies. In reality, what happens is this war pits the entire French Empire against the entire British Empire, and they fight this war all over the globe. It's a worldwide war. So the part of it that's fought in North America, in the Ohio River Valley, that is the French and Indian War. But the rest of the war that we're talking about, the rest of the war is called the, Se the Seven Years' War. And yeah, it's called the Seven Years' War because it's fought over seven years. Now, at the end of the Seven Years' War, it is a British victory, but it's been very, very costly. So the war ends in 1763, and we sign the Treaty of Paris, 1763, that ends the war. And so what Britain gets out of all of this is they get all of the land west of the Appalachian Mountains going all the way to the Mississippi River, which is great because that includes the Ohio River Valley, and that's what the colonists wanted in the first place. But they don't just get a whole bunch of land. Britain also gets a whole lot of war debt because it turns out that a global war that lasts for seven years is actually incredibly expensive. So Britain is in debt and they're asking themselves the question, who's going to pay for this war debt? Well, you got to also ask yourself the question, well, whose fault is it that we had a war? And the answer to that question... That's the colonists, because remember, it was the colonists that attacked the French in the Ohio River Valley, starting the French and Indian War, which then started the Seven Years' War, this global conflict of Britain versus France. All right, so the colonists are responsible, so we've got to find a way to make them pay. And what we're going to do is we're going to pass several taxes, because doesn't it make sense that the ones who caused it should be the ones who paid for it? 
They thought so, and it makes sense to us too, really, in hindsight. First of all, though, we pass the Proclamation of 1763. The Proclamation of 1763 is issued by King George III, right over here, King of Britain, and he issues this proclamation saying that no colonists, no colonists can move west of the Appalachian Mountains. The colonists don't listen to the Proclamation of 1763 because who's going to enforce it? King George is the King of England, thousand miles away, across an ocean, and besides, Everything west of the Appalachian Mountains is wilderness anyway, and who's going to find them when they get there? Who's going to track them down? Nobody. So they break the proclamation of 1763. They keep moving west. Now, the reason that Britain passed the proclamation of 1763 in the first place was to try and keep the colonists from coming into conflict with other groups of people. If we can keep them from interacting, then maybe we can avoid another war. Now, we've passed the proclamation of 1763. Now we have to actually go about trying to pay for this war. So, first of all, we pass the Stamp Act. Now, the Stamp Act is a tax on paper. So, what the Stamp Act says is every time you buy something that has paper or that is made of paper, it has to have a stamp on it showing that you've paid the tax. That can be playing cards, that can be mail, that can be newspapers, that can be books, that can be pamphlets. Anything on paper, you have to pay the tax. And so, this Stamp Act is a tax on just about all types of paper in the colonies. So, that's a way to make money. They also pass the Quartering Act. Now, the Quartering Act is not a tax, but it is a way for the British government to make money. Usually, the British army would be housed and fed inside barracks or inside a fort. The Quartering Act, though, says that instead of the British government paying for those barracks, paying for the food, paying for the laundry to wash the soldiers' clothing, paying for their supplies, instead of that happening, the British army is going to be housed inside colonists' homes. So who's going to be paying for their food? The colonists. Who's going to be paying uh, for their laundry? Who's going to be paying for anything they need? It's all going to be paid for by the colonists. So while it's not a direct tax on the colonists, it's definitely a way to save money and therefore repay some of that war debt. Well, the Stamp Act makes everybody so angry that, in fact, the colonists write a petition to the British government to change it. And the British government is like, <sighs> fine. Okay, we'll get rid of the Stamp Act, but we're also going to issue the Declaratory Act. Now, the Declaratory Act is very easy to remember because all it does is declares something. And it's King George declaring, okay, fine, we'll get rid of the Stamp Act, but from now on, you have to do as we say. Why? Because King George, colonists, you must answer to us. Along with the Declaratory Act, they also pass a group of acts called the Townsend Acts. And the Townsend Acts are just taxes on imports. Now, this is also very easy to remember if you break down the name. You have the word town. That's what this is. This weird little drawing is supposed to be a town. And then you have the word sin. The way we remember what the Townsend Acts are is it was a tax on everything that you would send into the town. So it's a tax on imports, things that they would bring into the colonies from other places like lead, like tea like glass, all those types of things. So all of these taxes and all of these acts are really beginning to frustrate the American colonists. And eventually this boils over in several events. The most famous one, perhaps, maybe, is the Boston Massacre. So there's a lone British officer guarding the British Customs House in Boston one evening. There's snow on the ground. It's been there for a while, though, so it's turned to ice. A whole bunch of events happen, and basically there's a mob scene where this lone officer is afraid for his life, so he calls in reinforcements. The British officers show up. The American colonist mob begins to get violent, and so one of the British soldiers fires his weapon into the crowd. Then the rest of the British officers think that there's been an order to fire when there hasn't, so they fire into the crowd. Several American colonists are dead at the end of this event. Blood has been spilt in Boston. And so the American colonists are incredibly upset at Britain because now Britain has brought blood onto their soil. Things are very, very tense in Boston. The real question, though, is what's going to happen to these soldiers? Are they guilty of murder? 
So these British soldiers who are going to be tried for murder, they need to find someone who's fair, that they can trust to defend them with the law. They turn to a famous lawyer at the time, John Adams. So John Adams defends these British soldiers in court. Are they guilty of murder? No, not guilty. But that doesn't solve the problem of tension in the colonies. And so the British government then passes another tax. This is the Tea Act. Now, the Tea Act, realistically, is probably the best tax of them all and probably the most reasonable of all. But at this point, the colonists are so mad that it really didn't matter what the tax was going to look like. They were determined to hate it. So the Tea Act actually lowers the price of tea. And the way they do this is they give a monopoly on tea to one British tea company, the East India Company. And so all the tea the colonists buy comes from the East India Company, but it lowers the price. So they're actually paying less, but it does take away that choice. They no longer choose who they buy from, and they really don't like that at all. So in response to this tax on tea, a group of American colonists called the Sons of Liberty, what they do is they climb aboard one of these ships that would have tea on it, and they take the tea and they throw it into the harbor. And this costs Britain millions of dollars because the tea is never paid for, the taxes are never paid for, they just lose that money. And so that really hurts the British government. So in response to the Boston Tea Party, Britain passes a new group of acts called the Coercive Acts. And the entire purpose of the Coercive Acts is to press down on the city of Boston. It is to crush them, to grind them into submission. Now the people in Boston, they don't think of them as the coercive acts. They think of them as the intolerable acts because these acts are so wicked, they're so vile and evil that we will not tolerate them. And so they begin to call them that. And that's an excellent example of propaganda. You can tell that the colonists' opinions about the British government are definitely beginning to shift. So, after the Coercive Acts and the Intolerable Acts, colonies begin to train their militias. Now, they're not setting up for war. These are not armies. These are just in case things get out of hand. Just in case things get dicey. Will they be prepared for a war if it comes to it? Kind of. It certainly looks that way. So they are training their militias. This makes Britain nervous. And so in response to the colonies training their militias, the British sends some of their army from the city of Boston and they march towards a nearby town called Concord. The reason they're going to Concord is that at Concord, there is a secret collection of colonial weapons. It's a weapons cache. And if, if the British army can manage to get there without the colonists finding out, then they can seize those weapons from the colonists and stop a war before it ever begins. However, thanks to Paul Revere and William Dawes, they get the word out, the colonists here, the militiamen are called out. And so while the British are marching from Boston to Concord, they first have to pass through a very small town called Lexington. And it's at Lexington that the British face off against just a couple dozen American militia men. It is here that the very first shot is fired. Now, who fired it? We don't know. But it's called the shot heard around the world because it starts events that will lead us into the American Revolution where there's no turning back. Speaking of no turning back, the British don't turn back. They continue to go on to Concord. But by the time they get there, the weapons are gone. They find nothing. And the American militia forces have gathered at the Old North Bridge and they turn the British back. So Lexington is a British victory. Concord, mm -mm, this is an American victory. And so the British soldiers have to march all the way back to Boston. But while they're doing that, all the way back, the American militiamen follow them. And the Minutemen fire at them, pow, from behind trees, or pew pew from nearby ditches, through the woods. While the British Army marches in file, they're continually fired at by the American colonists. Now at this time, the town of Boston is located on a peninsula because it's a port town, and that peninsula is surrounded by hills. And so what the colonists do as they follow the British back to Boston is they set up a fort, or they set up defenses at the top of those hills. This allows the colonists to fire down into the city or fire down at the British ships if they so desire. 
Now, typically, that wouldn't be a problem because each British ship has tons of cannons on it. All they would have to do is turn their cannons up towards the hills and then just absolutely blow them away. That's where the trick comes in, though. Because the American colonists are at the top of the hills, the British cannons, because they're inside their ships, you can't elevate them high enough to actually reach the colonists at the top. If the British are going to save Boston, if they're going to hold it, they have to get rid of the colonists over on Bunker and Breed's Hill. So, in order to capture Bunker Hill, the British are going to have to actually charge up the hill. Now, there's a famous quote that comes from this battle, and in fact, nobody can actually prove that it was said at all. But it's very, very important for us to remember as students of American history because it reminds us what happens here. And the quote is, hold your fire till you see the whites of their eyes. And the reason this quote was said by an American commander is because muskets or guns at this time were known to be incredibly inaccurate. And we know that the Americans needed every single shot to count because they were low on ammunition. They couldn't continue firing forever. They didn't have enough gunpowder. And so they needed every single shot to count. And so by waiting for the British to get close enough to see the whites of their eyes, they could be sure of hitting their target. So they charge up the hill once. The American colonists fire down at them and the British are forced to retreat. So the British army charges up a second time. The American colonists fire at them. And so the British are forced to retreat. The third time, though, this is when that quote becomes so important because the third time, it becomes clear the American colonists are actually out of ammunition. They have no more powder left to fire their guns. And so the third time the British charge the hill, the American colonists are actually throwing rocks. And so the Americans have to retreat. But they do get something important from this battle. Even though this is technically a British victory, the Americans get something very important. They receive a gift. And the gift that they receive is the gift of hope. Because even though they didn't win this battle, think about what might have happened if they had had the ammunition they needed. It proves to the American colonies that their soldiers can stand toe to toe against the mighty British army and live to tell about it. And they might actually win. I want you to notice something. Lexington and Concord, the Battle of Bunker Hill, these have all happened before 1776, before we have ever declared independence, this war has already begun, hasn't it? Basically, it has. In January of 1776, a basically a superhero of the American Revolution writes a very important pamphlet. This pamphlet is called Common Sense, and it's written by a man named Thomas Paine, or as I like to call him, the original T. Paine. Thomas Paine and his pamphlet, Common Sense, is America's first bestseller. In the first few months of its existence, it sells 50,000 copies. That's enough for one in every 25 Americans to have one. Everyone was talking about this pamphlet. They would talk about it at the coffee houses, in the streets. If you could read, you read it. If you couldn't read, someone read it to you, and then you talked about Common Sense. By the end of Common Sense's popularity, it had sold over 250,000 copies. That's enough for one in five American colonists to own one. It is safe to say that everybody read this book and it made a profound impact on the chain of events. Thomas Paine's common sense is all about convincing the American people that they need to declare independence. So it's written in January of 1776. Just a few months later, Thomas Paine's job is done. He's convinced the American people to declare independence. And so July 4th, 1776, we have the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these blessings, Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, which is to say, Britain, we no longer consider your government just. We no longer consent to be ruled by you. We declare ourselves free, and we're coming for you. So that's our recap of the road to revolution, tracing how the French and Indian War leads almost directly to the Revolutionary War. I hope you learned something. See you next time.